when I found music. It was like, this thing, this relationship between this music and what it makes me feel, when I get closer to it, something is in there. I think the moment that I decided that music was gonna be it, that's when I knew I had made it. It wasn't about the success because the destination has never been some specific award or thing. It's been the work, right? That to me is when I think I made it, when I decided that music was what I was gonna do. Everybody has a story, and there is something to be learned from every experience. Nobody knows your future but you. You're in charge of your own book. It's very important that you love and respect yourself first. You don't have to like a person, but you gotta respect them. Be human enough to make mistakes and be flawed. We have to be brave. We have to be bold. When it look like you ain't gonna make it, when you feel like giving up, don't. You can do anything you put your mind to. Believe in yourself. Don't step with anger. Step with clarity. We are not meant to be perfect. We're meant to be whole. When you learn, teach. Use your life as a class. Some entertainers are just born for the spotlight. R&B superstar Usher Raymond IV has been basking in that light with his soulful voice and electrifying dance moves for over 20 years. Usher's success is personally meaningful to me because he first appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show way back in 1995. He was only 16. It's been a pleasure to watch Usher grow from a teenager with big, big dreams to the eight-time Grammy winner he is today. Usher discovered his passion for music at an early age. His natural talent and dazzling performances on Star Search caught the attention of music executive L.A. Reid, who signed Usher to his label, LaFace Records. Hoping to cultivate his potential, the label sent 13-year-old Usher to New York City to be mentored by an up-and-comer named Sean Puffy Combs. In New York, Usher was introduced to an ocean of temptations he wasn't quite ready for. I'm 13 years old. I would do anything that I possibly could for people to hear my voice. Fast forward to, I get a deal. I get a deal with LaFace Records, and it's now about to happen. Every time I look at you, they decided that Sean Puffy Combs was the person that really helped me understand what it was to exist as an artist. So going to New York City was full of so many obstacles. One, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Now being in this big city, I don't know nobody. I don't know my way around. I don't know the culture, what this place is. I don't even know what the word culture meant at the time. <laughs> and it was hard. There were, there were a lot of things I seen and uh, a lot of positions that I think I was put in where I had to make very, very tough decisions in my life about who I would be. I was 13 years old, and being 13, having that type of exposure, you know, yeah, it was cool to go to Howard Homecoming with Puff. It was great to be able to go to Club USA or the Supper Club, you know, with Puffy in that time, or the Tunnel. But these are places that a 13-year-old probably should not be. You know, most kids would be excited about it. You know, most kids are trying to figure out you know, how to be around, you know, hot girls, pretty girls. I'm around grown women, and I'm seeing them do things and, and have experiences that I'm not quite ready for. You know, and I think that he was just trying to show me the lifestyle. However, that's not what I was there for. I was there because I wanted a career, man. So we would fight, we would tussle. <laughs> More than often, I think Puffy would say, man, you gotta chill, like you're just a little bit too intense. You know, you gotta relax. Like, yo, man, I'm here to work, man. I ain't saying in a week. I mean, I'm 
13 years old, like banging on this man as though, <laughs> you know, I am the manager. I am the spokesperson for Usher. And I'm telling him, look, you gonna put me in the studio, man. You got Biggie Smalls in there. You got Craig Mack in there. You're gonna make me a priority too. I'm not here to party with you. I don't wanna go to the clubs. I'm, matter of fact, I'm too young to even be in here. Why you got me in clubs? I think as a kid, I realized, hey, look, that's not my ring. That's not my moment. That's not my bottle. That's not my drink. That's not my celebration. So I'm not here to celebrate. I wanted people to be excited about me the way that they were excited about him. I wanted my own success. So I would stay at the studio. All of what I could absorb from being an artist, being around other performers like Mary J. Blige, Jodeci, I'll Be Sure at the time, Missy Elliott, Timbaland, all of these people, I would just absorb every bit of what I could get my hands on. I was just pulling everything I possibly could. There was a lesson in all of it. There was something to pull from it all because I, I, I got a chance to see a glimpse of the lifestyle a glimpse of the idea of what it was to be successful. And, and, and part of all of this is really, if you can see it, then you should believe it. I think everybody needs a mentor. Who you choose to invest in as that mentor is really up to who you see yourself being. Because as a result of being around that man, Sean Puffy Combs, I don't sleep to this day. I have a problem sleeping to this day. I got it from him. I mean, this is a dude who just never slept. He's just, I mean, he's the, probably the first one to get up and the last one to go to sleep. And that, that commitment, I picked up. Generally speaking, I think that uh, on the road to riches, don't forget to stop and take pictures because <laughs> you're gonna see a lot of things and you need to remember those things because they will become valuable lessons in helping uh, to prepare you for the next level. I mean, let's just start with the fact that, you know, as an African-American coming from the South, you know, that opportunity to exceed expectation isn't readily available for me. So at the age of eight, nine, and I begin to ask myself, like, what am I going to do with my life? Who am I going to be? Am I going to be um, a teenager who sleeps on my mom's couch looking for, you know, a menial job that, you know, will at least give me enough to just pay for gas to get there and from every day? No, nah, I want to do something that I feel is going to take my mom uh, out of here and, and hopefully put us in a better situation. So what would that be? Because I know whatever I have to do, whatever I choose to do, I have to start now. I don't know. I tried everything. I tried baseball, football, basketball. I wasn't tall enough. I wasn't, you know, strong enough. I wasn't you know, fast enough. But then I think I was watching Michael Jackson or something. He was performing somewhere in Germany. And there's this small stage and this huge, you know, stadium. And there's people everywhere. I mean, so many people that... There's no way that you were able to see what was going on in that small box. It was just this sea of people around this stage. And something about that vision, something about seeing that made me begin to have visions of my own. That someday I'd have an audience. I'd be performing in front of an audience. I'd be performing in front of people who were my fans. Mother, she was the youth director of um, a choir, and um, I joined her choir. I was around it, so I, I, I just said, okay, fine, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna try this. I built up enough confidence uh, in church to go down and sing and take a solo. And after I did my first solo, I felt like, I, man, I have a talent. I can literally do it. I can sing, if not 
just as good, better than the people who are on the radio. So why shouldn't I have a shot at it? When I can dance and I love it, I could sing and I love it. I could learn music at that age and love it. This is something that I could do. This is something that I could be comfortable doing. I guess it was like a, they say a, a seed, right? The seed of hope and faith that I could do that began to create this little circle that became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So I was able to hold on to those little moments that gave me hope that, okay, if I work at something long enough, I have to become successful at it. So let me start now. So eight years old, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Then I would tell people, you know, one day I'm going to have fans. One day I'm going to sign an autograph for you. And they would look at me like, who is this little kid think he is? I was just being honest. <laughs> I was just telling them what I knew could potentially or would potentially happen um, because I believed it. There was something in that, that delusional dream, right? I think we all have imagination. I think if we are able to fuel our imagination, that's when we begin to have the ideas that lead us to the realities. Something about that conviction and that speaking it into existence was the beginning of me uh, creating Usher. <laughs> or at the time, my name was Cha-Cha. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up on Masterclass with Usher. My father really had difficulties with uh, drug addiction. By the time I began to get to know him, his body had been so riddled by drugs and by his abuse that he had liver, uh, uh, liver issues. And within the process of undergoing a liver transplant, he slipped into a coma. You're watching Masterclass with Usher. I do believe that life rewards decision. I think the moment that you decide that this is what I'm going to do and you're unwavering about it, something happens. The action of that. A ripple goes out. The world hears it, the energy hears it of life. And it's like, okay, so now we're gonna begin to present obstacles for you to see if you really are dedicated. Are you sure you wanna do this? Because here's an obstacle. And for you, it's like, man, this is the biggest obstacle ever. Oh my God, I can't get over this. And if you do, oh, okay, great, but there's another obstacle. And if you get over that obstacle, it's like, oh shit, I just did it. Oh, that's another obstacle. And then you get over this next one and you're like, I cannot believe that I'm still dealing with these. I thought I made it, but there's another obstacle. And that's life. It was hard making my first album because I had lost my voice. My golden ticket was my voice. And I lost it. This girl is changing my mind, so what? I really don't care. I got a headache, you know, from doing all them high notes. I don't know if it's something that all people deal with because that's what I've been told at the time. That, hey man, it's just puberty, you're gonna go through it. But, you know, when you raise your voice to sing and you could do it so easily, now it's not there, it's gone. And you don't know if it's gonna come back either. You know, I'll never forget the first day I'm getting ready to do a showcase for my record company and I know I don't have the voice to sing the song. I waited all my life for this opportunity. I got a record deal. There's nothing you can take. There's no medication. There's nothing you can do to, to ease this moment. So I performed before this audience. And no matter how much confidence we as artists have, no matter what age, you see when people are reacting, they're shifting in their seats, they're looking at each other. They're, you know, they're, there's that, there's that odd silence, there's that, You know, and you feel that as a kid, it's like, wow, I'm not strong enough to even understand this type of rejection. It's just been, oh man, there's such opportunity, there's such promise. You're so poised to be this, that, da, 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 da. 
and it's all getting ready to disappear. I came home and I just, I ran out of my house and I just, I, I started running. I didn't stop. I think I may have ran about 10 miles. And when I finally decided to stop, I made up in my mind that I was gonna go back home and I was gonna face this as hard as it was. And when I got back, my mother, she told me, I know this is hard, but um, we're gonna we're gonna fight for it. We're gonna fight through it. You're gonna be all right. We're gonna get vocal coaches, whatever we gotta do. And I'm gonna make sure that they don't drop you. Because the question was, is he going to, you know, sustain? We may have to drop him. I heard them say that. So there was an obstacle. There was an opportunity to prove them wrong, to prove myself right, that what I felt, what I believed would happen. So there was no stopping. There was no option, once again, to stop. I had to fight for it. You can either give up or you can fight for another opportunity. You know, it's like, do you turn away from what you said you were passionate about? Do you find a means to get to it in another way? You make a way or you give up. Giving up is not an option in life. There's always a way. There is always a way, no matter how bad it is, no matter how dark it looks, no matter how complicated it is, there is always a way. And if I had not gone through a lot of the things that I, I did, I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't have the respect for the place um, that I sit. Coming up on Masterclass with Usher. You don't want to teach your children negativity, but if a police officer who may pull my child over someday may not necessarily be properly trained to handle a situation, and then their life may be at stake. By his second album, Usher's quest for artistic growth brought him to chart-climbing producer Jermaine Dupri. And what followed was a period of self-discovery. Usher had found his artistic voice. Yo! Y'all ready? I said, are you ready? Let's go. One, two, three, turn it I mean, if I have to compare singing in the church versus, you know, standing in front of 30,000 people, I mean, it's a bigger audience, but the passion is the same. You can move things with performance. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be about love. Sometimes it could be, you know, a meaningful message that's needed. That platform, being able to speak to that, that scale of an audience and have that magnitude, right? That platform, that ability to exploit issues or either talk about issues. I've always been able to speak to you through the music. And uh, that one was important, man. I felt like we gotta love again, man. We gotta have fun. Being able to perform gave me another way of articulating myself. It gave me an opportunity to address issues that, you know, I see, things that I feel. You know, hold some of the most incredible, fun, or not, emotional experiences in life. That idea of you go through something to get to something, I've lived it. My first album, I was in the process of trying to establish who I was as an artist. I don't think the idea was for me to be a child star. I think the idea was to be someone who could cater to a young audience as well as an older audience. This was obviously off the beaten path of who and what I came from. Give it up for my man, Usherina. Come on, y'all. It was more uh, songs that were selected. Uh, and while some of them were good, uh, they weren't my own. Uh, but there was a reward in being able to finally cross that first, you know, 
stop point. I needed it. By the time I uh, started to perform the songs on my first album, my voice began to come back. And my confidence began to be restored as a result of performing some of the songs. Uh, that was the beginning of recognizing that I needed to make an album that really spoke more to who I was. Jermaine Dupri was brought into the equation, and it worked. I do everything you want to make your girl say, ooh, ooh, why she so fly? She beats me, but she wanna get freaky. You can get mad if you want to, say whatever you want, but she's still gonna give it up. She likes it my way. That was my voice, that was my first time, it was my way. That was my opportunity to begin to let you know who I was. JD understood how to kind of bridge that gap between being a young artist and having a vibe, being fly, and also to being from the South because he understood it. We made that album in his basement and we sat, we talked. I talked to him about the things that I wanted to hear, the things that I, I felt like I needed to talk about. He spoke to me about things that he felt I needed. And there was, you know, a kindred relationship that worked. I think it's just the fact that I just chose to open up. When you're able to just say it and just be honest, that ain't about being a superstar. That's about being a person. Listen to yourself. Success is freedom. Freedom to express yourself. Freedom to go where you want. Freedom to say what you feel. Freedom to be as loud as you want to be. I think the moment that you decide to be free and just be happy, you know, that right there is success. Check me, it was your girl who let me make it this far then. Ooh, we had to have it every chance that she could get. But you think you a baller, and I ain't gonna call her. Clip that. Life is what happens when you're making other plans. Did I see all of the things that I am now? No, that's what I mean when I say life happens when you're making other plans. I mean, the majority of the things that have happened, it was all based on my imagination and my belief in self. You may have an idea of what you think your life is gonna be. You may have an idea or concept of what you wanna do. You know, um, passion leads us all. But the reality is we react to what happens. Reacting is the reality to what makes a success in life. How you react will determine what happens next. I mean, it all started with me and my mom in every sense of the word. She was there, you know, she was there and she did her best. I think that um, she offered her time. She offered her commitment to helping me find my passion. From the age of 11 or 12, I uh, was in a group, a group by the name of The New Beginning. That was the beginning of my career. That was the beginning of the idea of me being a solo artist. My mother took me out of the group. We moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and I started my solo career. meeting different people, different producers. I would do whatever I possibly could to get their attention. So we start down this road of, you know, music and entertainment. My mother's very stern. She doesn't move <laughs> when she has an idea. And there has to be this idea of integrity, I think that made her decision-making what it was. And then it turned into a career for her. We've had some incredible, incredible experiences. And that came by way of her belief in me and her belief in the fact that I was who I said I was and I was who she felt I was. Because it does take a true village to be successful in anything that you do. It's never just one person. No one man is an island. 
But we began to part our ways when I wanted to expand in other areas that I felt like she wasn't necessarily considerate of. You know, why create this tension when I'm attempting to grow as a man? I think I've spent so many years focusing on being an artist and being recognized as this talent. It ain't about that no more. Now it's about who I am as a man and I need you to be as supportive of me as a man. There's a lot of love there. And uh, there's a lot of respect there for what her commitment has been and who she is as a woman. We can try to say that we are a product of what happens to us, but we have the responsibility of you know, steering the car at some point. You know, you're in a car until you take the wheel. And I'm so happy that I was in a car that was going in the right direction. It made me a stronger person. It made me a person who was very clear about what I wanted. And be it right or wrong, it was my story. We both decided that it would be better for us to sever our ties in business. It does bother me at times when I I look to my right or my left and she ain't there, you know, because I do miss her at least being in the position of celebrating all of the hard work and time that had been put into this career. Uh, I appreciate her for her contribution. I appreciate her for um, her commitment and her being unwavering about what she felt I deserved because it actually made me uh, a lot stronger. As it relates to my father, Usher Raymond III, I thank him for my name. He was a man with a name, and I was very happy to have that name. But the reality is he wasn't there. And I think I was uh, maybe 21 when I finally got a chance to have that connection. I think I began to think about what life would be if I just decided to never know him. And I didn't want my life to go that way. So I reached out to him. I brought him closer to me. You know, he um, really had difficulties with uh, drug addiction. By the time I began to get to know him, his body had been so riddled by drugs and by his abuse that he he had liver, uh, uh, liver issues. I was really left in a very odd position because he left me as the decision maker uh, of his health and on his behalf. Man. It was so hard, it was, it was hard because I, <laughs> I make the decision whether you live or you die. That right there killed me. It's like, I, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready to have to make that decision. He's being held in intensive care at the time. They say he needs his transplant. And I have to make the decision. So I go to the studio and I'm talking to my friend Nelly. First of all, he said, why did you decide to reach out to your father? I said, because I wanted to have a relationship with him. So imagine if you decide at this moment to just let it go and not try. I put my anger aside, and I have to thank Nelly for it because if he didn't tell me, you gotta really think about what matters. Because if he leaves, if he dies, and you didn't try, is that gonna be better than you spending this money to give him the transplant to invest in what you decided to do? And um, I did it. And within the process of undergoing a liver transplant um, at Emory Hospital, he slipped into a coma and um, he didn't make it back. I guess the hardest part of this story is the fact that within the process of making the decision of whether my father lives or dies, if they take him off of the, um, the machine, my son is across town just being born. The whole purpose and reason behind even trying to fix this relationship was to make sure that my son knew 
where his name came from. And, you know, legacy is important to me. The idea of who we are um, and where we come from is very important. But I lost that opportunity. He never got a chance to meet him. When life shows itself to be tumultuous, it's because you're being prepared for something greater. That's what I believe. Leave no doubt in life is what I learned from that situation. I tried my best to right the wrong that was my father. He made a decision not to be in my life. So now I make the decision to be in my children's life. Usher and Navid will never know a day where there's a father who wasn't there or who elects not to be there. I'm gonna be there for him. I'm gonna be as helpful as I possibly can and be strong for them and strong with them. I just know that I, I'll never be unavailable. This is Masterclass with Usher. The people that I've looked up to for so many years, like Stevie Wonder, like Michael Jackson, like Herbie Hancock, like Luther Vandross, Quincy Jones, all of these people, the fact that they have admiration for me and let me know it, that right there is more valuable than any award, than anything. That I spoke to Prince and he let me know how he felt about me. You know, the fact that James Brown looked at me and he named me the Godson of Soul. Since you call yourself hardworking, that's the hardest working man in show business that just told you you were the Godson of Soul. So what does that say? The highlights of who I am start with recognition. That to me is more valuable than any award, any accolade. That right there has been the reward for me. It makes sense to say that we could choose to be happy, but the reality is life is constantly bearing down on you. Life is constantly giving you an indication that things can be negative or positive. It's really how you choose to look at it. But great companionship is the true beginning of happiness because if your house is not in order, if your house is not at least in the calmest of places when you need it, your life is a wreck. I'm happy in this new marriage. I think that's the difference between this marriage and the one that I had before. I think I was doing more work than I needed to. Damn the fact that we, in my first marriage, came from two different worlds. I think a lot of it started with the fact that we had a child together. And that then added a pressure that wasn't necessary. I just don't think we were meant to be. I don't think that it was meant to be forever. We were meant to have children together because they have become an incredible source of happiness and commitment on both of our parts. That definitely proved uh, to be a worthwhile lesson uh, in life. That you should definitely go with your first mind. And uh, if you tell yourself, you shouldn't do this, listen to yourself. Unconditional love mutually is important. And I think I found a woman who really does love me with all of my complications, and I love her with all her complications. More than likely, you're coming with the baggage of the past. So you have to manage to not penalize the new person that you're with as a result of what you felt in the past. Grow through your experiences, get over it. Move on to the next piece of life. And not until you decide to put down the bags that you have of the past can you begin to take the journey of a new trip. And that trip, that travel, that experience is a luxury if you let all that other stuff go. When you look at relationships that go 18, 20, 30, 40 years, it's not going to be smooth all the way. But to know that throughout all of those difficult times you have someone who is there for you, someone who is considerate, someone who understands how to be patient with you through your difficult times. That right there is what 
has made a great marriage and what I think is a great thing to look for in a marriage. If you don't have that, if a person is too judgmental, if a person isn't patient with you and able to kind of work through your situations and make great suggestions that prove to be successful, then run. <laughs> You know, I've done my best uh, to be a great father, maybe even without a proper reference of my own. But I, I think I've collected enough experience from life to be able to, you know, create the idea of what it is that I feel a great father is for his child or his children. And that is being available. That is being mindful of who they're gonna be and giving them the reality of what life looks like before they have to deal with it firsthand. It is true that we are raising future adults. It is true that, you know, the investment in time that you put into these young people develop the young men that they will be. Life is just constantly dealing you different cards, a different idea of what it is and what it's all about. As a result of what life shows you, you have to be willing and ready to react. Don't let life just do whatever it's gonna do to you. You have to push back, you have to push forward. Because these are young black boys, uh, the reality of how they may be perceived and how they may be treated is more vivid than it's ever been. What I do is just try to teach my kids, you know, respect for themselves, respect for others, uh, in hopes that they'll be able to stay alive through complicated situations. If a police officer who may pull my child over someday, you know, may not necessarily be uh, properly trained to handle a situation, and then their life may be at stake. You know, I, I think about all of those things when I'm, I'm raising them. You don't want to teach your children negativity, but you do have to answer the question if they are inquisitive about it. Like, well, so wait a minute. These people just killed this person because uh, they were threatened. And I make them clear, yes, it was fear in many ways on both parts that, you know, made that situation what it was. But you got to stay alive at the end of the day. That's what's in the back of my head. You gotta remember, the most important part is to stay alive in the situation. So what does that take? Sometimes it takes a bit of humility. It's the reality of the world that we're living in. And you know, this veil of racism is being lifted on a daily basis by the people who are, um, are speaking. I don't care whether or fact and whether or not you are Muslim or Christian, Hare Krishna or Buddhist, I don't care what you ascribe to for one minute, I want you to open up your mouth and begin praying out loud that God will bring justice to this city. And you know, that reality may not necessarily touch all of our children and you don't want them to, but it in some way, unfortunately, is more likely because of the color of your skin to be judged and looked at a certain way. I wish it wasn't that way. But it is. And some of the seeds that I've been planting about, you know, if you are angry about something, it's okay to speak about it, but be organized. Uh, know what you're talking about and have your information correct before you decide to step out. Don't step with anger, step with clarity. Usher's two plus decades of hard work have paid off handsomely. He has sold over 65 million albums and won eight Grammys all before turning 40. I've watched him go from a teenage boy collaborating with his idols to becoming an idol for millions around the globe. I can't wait to see where his relentless ambition carries him next. Usher, for your dazzling, amazing music, your incredible dance moves, and your ability to balance family, success, life. 
you're a master. I think the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that I don't stop. It's kind of my gift and my curse because what's enough? Is an Emmy enough? Are several Grammys enough? Is a Diamond Award enough? I don't know. The point is, I like being busy. I like being challenged because it gives me hope, man, that there's just more out there. And I don't know what it is. I just, I decided to be passionate about one thing and it led me so many other places. And as a result of that, it's now given me an opportunity to, to not only be, I guess, an example for my kids, but also to uh, an example for people who uh, can take nothing and make something. And if you find the commitment and the passion in what you love first and foremost, it's gonna lead you so many different places and how you react to what happens and how you respond to the positions that you put in, um, that begins to create the person that you are, the personality that you, that you are. If you want long-term success, find something you love, find something that's not about money, find something that is about the passion, about the connection to it, about the art of it, about the expression of it, and run with it. Don't stop. Don't stop moving. Whatever you do, I don't care how bad it looks, don't stop moving. You gotta stay in it.